Right, welcome back to the next episode of the Foundational Like Coaches Coffee Club podcast. Um, today we are joined by Ryan Davies, who works in the for the FA as part of the the PE team. Um, he's got a lot of experience working across football and physical education, um, and he's just sort of going to do a little bit of a, a podcast with us today, talking around primary school PE specifically. But hopefully, we'll be able to jump into a, a few different topics. Um, Ryan, thanks for coming in. You're welcome. Nice to meet you. First of all. I wonder if you would want to just sort of tell the, the viewers a little bit about your journey so far, how you got into coaching, what your, your career has looked like. Yeah, definitely. Uh, first, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be on here, following in some uh, steam footsteps that have been on there on this pre- previously. Um, probably start off by saying that I didn't actually intend to be a coach. Um, I think when I was growing up, which was a long time ago, um, coaches, I, I saw coaches as people who were very big characters and, you know, the people who were shouting and screaming at people. Um and that's not really my personality. So I, I didn't think I had kind of what it takes to be a coach, if that makes sense. Um, but in terms of where my actual journey started, probably, you know, like a lot of probably the coaches watching um, in, a, in a playing capacity. So when, when I left school, I went out to uh, Australia to, to uh, go and trial a professional team out there. Um, didn't exactly go according to plan because I got sent off after seven minutes in my debut and, and then got released. So it wasn't the most illustrious professional football career. Um, but what it did do is is give me a um, chance to play part time out there, and then in the club that I ended up playing for, uh, I just helped out with with the youth teams there, and that was kind of my first step on the ladder, if you like. And it certainly wasn't coaching; it was definitely a case of putting the cones out and carrying the balls. But um, that was kind of my first insight into it. Um, after being in Australia for a while, I had, had the decision to either stay out there and lie on a beach and, and surf for the rest of my life or come back and go to university to, to train to be a PE teacher. Um, I think some people probably thought I made the wrong choice, but I, I, you know, PE teaching was something that if football hadn't worked out, I always wanted to uh, always wanted to, to, to go into. So I uh, came back to go to university um, and it was when I was at university, um, I remember one day, I remember it vividly, one of the, um, we had a lecture and, and the tutor at the end of it um, just uh, said that his wife was a was a primary school PE teacher and they had a group of, of pupils who were just dying to play some football but there was nobody in the primary school who had any expertise or, or knowledge in terms of football so um, he just said you know there was a there was a hundred of us sitting in that lecture that he uh, a trained to be PE teacher and just said would anyone be willing to give up an hour a week just to go in and, and coach them for six weeks and give them an opportunity to play and I, I, I was sitting on the front row and I put my hand up I turned around and I was I was the only person who put my hand up out of those hundred people, so I got the gig, whether whether he uh, liked it or not. And that was the first time that you know I had six weeks to actually you know go in and and and, and plan some sessions. Um, what I hadn't realised was that 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 lecturer um, actually also coached at La Manga Club out in Spain as well. And at the end of the six weeks, he just came to me and said that you know the school had said I'd done a decent job. I don't know whether I had it done or not, but they <laughs> said they, they said I'd done a decent job and. Um, he said, "Did I want to go out in the in the university holidays to to coach at La Manga Club in in Spain, uh, their academy there?" And I was just like, "Thought it was a joke at first, but I was like, you know, definitely 100%." Um, so so went out there, um, and that was that was brilliant in terms of experience, um, in terms of from a coaching perspective, coaching different nationalities, children and backgrounds, um, but also La Manga Club is 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 very much a base for warm weather training for a lot of professional clubs so England had been out there before when I was there there was te- youth teams from Real Madrid from Juventus who were using it as a base and just being around that environment was just uh, was just an unbelievable experience kind of at the start of my, my, my coaching career um, and then also while, while I was at university uh, I applied for a job for one of the summers to go out to America and um, so I did a, did a summer out there which was very much a holiday holiday clubs and um, you know, very, very different in terms of, um, you know, the children that you had in front of you day to day, um, but also coaching some college university teams out there as well. Um, so a real good variety in terms of in terms of what we were doing. Um, once I uh, qualified as a, as a PE teacher, got my first role um, uh, teaching in a, in a secondary school. And, you know, you, you both know from, you know, from the work you've done in schools that that's, you know, it's a brilliant kind of grounded in terms of experience and um, particularly in secondary schools where I was teaching, you know, different activities, different sports. Um, 
but also that was the first time that I got the opportunity to actually coach teams as well because you know at any point I had three or four different football teams but also other sports as well where you know I was responsible for their fixtures I was responsible for um you know coaching them having it having a session a week for, for each of the teams to, to, to build up to that so um yeah that that was kind of the first time I had teams myself um obviously P teaching was something I was really passionate about but also football as well um and so at the same time I applied for a, a role um, scouting for Middlesbrough Football Club. So I was doing that on a weekend um, in terms of just going around grassroots games and, um, you know, seeing if there's anybody who's, who's, you know, potentially good enough for Middlesbrough's academy. Um, but what that did give me was a kind of a, a free pass for the, for the training ground at Rockcliffe. And um, that was great in terms of going in and just seeing coaches in, in a, you know, a really high environment. Um, delivering, so I just go there on a the night and watch the likes of you know Gary Bennett, some of the, some of the legend who was there at the time. Um, Craig Hignett was one of the academy coaches there, and just the opportunity to go and observe them was was just was brilliant. Um, I always had you know I'd done that for a couple of years. I've been teaching for four or five years at this point, but I'd always wanted to to go back out to Spain, having having had that experience um, coaching out there. So. I, uh, a job came up at a school um, as, as a head of PE um, at a school in Las Palmas in the Canary Islands. Um, so I yeah applied for that and, and got that. And again, that was just brilliant experience going out there. Um, again, teaching children of different nationalities, um, a completely different environments teaching out here. Um, but also from a football perspective, you know, I played out there for two seasons and, you know, I know you two both been out of Spain in a completely different game, especially, you know, 10 years ago when it was. And, you know, I was always, I was growing up, I've been about this tall since I was about nine, so I was always a centre-back. And, you know, growing up in my area, it was a case that, you know, when I got the ball, it was kick it as far away from all goals as possible and get it to someone who can play. Um, but I was out there, you know, I remember the first game, the goalkeeper kept rolling it to me. I was like, what's going on here? What do you want me to do with this? And But he gave me that, you know, a different insight into the game. Um as well as, uh, you know, the fact that it, it was essentially a non-contact sport out there, you know, and as a centre-back who, you know, had always been taught, you know, let them know you're there first five minutes as I was growing up. And I think I got 14 yellow cards in my first season um, just because, you know, you touch someone, they go down and it was a free kick. And, you know, sometimes I didn't react too well to that happening. But again, it was, you know, it was a, it was a brilliant um, insight into the game and, and different aspects I was also doing um, writing some reports for Middlesbrough, still out there looking at, um, at like Secunda Division games who Las Palmas were in at, at that time. So just writing some reports on potential players that I thought might be appropriate for Middlesbrough to sign. Um, but then, yeah, was was out there for a couple of years and then came back to teach um, in Leeds, um, uh, which was uh, a mix of primary and secondary, as it had been out in in, in Spain, and um, also at the same time. Uh, got a role at Manchester City in their scouting department. Um, and I'd say that is the moment that, you know, up until this point, I didn't have a coaching qualification to my name. You know, it, it, your job was just being gaining experience. And um, that was probably where things started to take off from a coaching perspective because um, we recommended players in, in Yorkshire, which is my region, to go to the, the development centre for Manchester City, which was based in Leeds. And I started doing some, some coaching at the development centre and then um, that soon led to doing a little bit of stuff with the pre-academy over in at the Academy in Manchester. And then from there, I was asked to go on to the uh, to the Manchester City women's side of things and, and work with our RTC programme. Um, and it was at that point that, you know, through doing um, my youth award and through doing um, my, B, my, my B licence that I had a tutor, Gorn Staniforth, who I'm sure a lot of the, the coaches watching will know, you know, his daughter Lucy played, played for Sunderland as Lioness and... He was the one who, you know, had a massive impact on me because he made me realise that, you know, that the skill set that I had from 10 years of teaching could actually really help me and, and benefit and be useful as an effective coach. Whereas I think up until then, I'd probably seen them as two separate things, which, you know, I think they've got closer and closer. And I didn't have to be that person who was screaming and shouting at people to be an effective coach. Um, so, you know, uh, at that time, uh, he, he gave me a call one day and just said that, you know, a job's come up at the FA in, in the PE team. Um, at that point, I was teaching full-time in Leeds, but also, 
You know, it's like in, in, in academy football, RTCs, you know, that tends to become a bit of a full-time job as well on the side. Um, when I was over in Manchester three, four, five times a week, and then uh, Gordon rang me up and just said, you know, we've got this opportunity in the PE team, and it just combined the, the, the two things I was doing in terms of the coaching side of things and, and, and the teaching, it, it was perfect. And, you know, to, to get that, to get the role that I've got now, it's, it's, it's been the best six years because it's, it's, it's my dream job. You know, it's, you know, still get excited getting up and putting England tracksuit on, which for me is like, you know, wearing that three lives is just like the ultimate honour. And so it's, it's an absolute privilege every day to do that. And, um, you know, in that, in the course of the last six years, from, from coaching perspective, as well as kind of the day job as, as coach development and teacher development, I've uh, done some stuff with um, Hartlepool United women um, in, in terms of their first team, coaching them for a couple of seasons. And then last two years, I've been at York City RTC, working with uh, under 16s. And then kind of to, to bring us up to, to where we are today, um, I uh, got the opportunity last few months to get involved with the England para team. Um, so, you know, there's deaf, cerebral palsy, blind, power chair, and um, just to, to get a little bit of a, an insight into into that and, and England squads and um, been doing some talent ID work for them. And then also got the opportunity to join the, the past decided team on their pre-World Cup uh, camp in in the summer as well, so um, yeah, quite quite a, a mixed, varied um, journey, I suppose. You know, from from teaching in reception in schools to um, you know being in the round England teams at St George's Park. So it's you know I've been being very fortunate, and, and like I said, you know, really looking to do the job that I do now in terms of supporting teachers and coaches uh, on a day-to-day basis, wearing the three lines. So it's quite the journey. Well, yeah, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Uh, there was a couple of points that you made just during, obviously talking about your journey there, I think will probably link into uh, what we're going to talk about on the topic, especially when you you talked around teaching and coaching being very much the same and, and how you can sort of transfer those those skills across. Um, so we've got Jake here, who I'm sure a lot of the, the viewers will know from various foundation programmes. Jake's the, the primary stars lead here, so he leads on all of our primary school PE in terms of managing the coaches and setting the, the curriculum stuff that that they do within the, the primary schools. So Jake's sort of going to take a little bit of a, a lead on the conversation now just to, to talk a little bit more detail around primary school PE. Yeah. Uh, I think, first of all, the like a couple of things you mentioned that like you started off in a secondary school. Which age group do you think sort of you're more suited to? Which one do you most enjoy? Because what we see of sort of your role is impacting the primary school level. Yeah. I think, you know, probably that fundamental differences, you know, potentially between primary school and secondary school. Um, probably secondary school, rightly or wrongly, is a little bit more sport focused. You know, some schools are very sport focused and the fact that, you know, I don't know what happens between that leaving primary school in year six and that six weeks of year seven, suddenly, right, we're playing, you know, 13 aside rugby, we're playing, you know, or whatever it might be. Um, I think, you know, the job of a primary school teacher is so important because by the time they get to 11, 12 years old, you get to secondary school, we've potentially lost them in terms of their love and engagement for the subject. So I think that's the, you know, that, that primary school environment that they have is, is absolutely vital. And, you know, the work that you guys and your team do in, in terms of primary schools, not only working with the children to give them a, an experience, but, you know, give the teachers that, that confidence to deliver high quality PE. I think that's, that's vital. Um, it's not to say that you know high quality PE in secondary school isn't isn't, isn't going to be effective because it absolutely is, and I think it, it potentially. I know certainly when I got to secondary school as a pupil myself, I had probably more opportunities to do lots of variety of different things, and you know it, it, I think that, that that the role that, that secondary school teachers play in, in in kind of keeping that fire burning, if you like, and giving children opportunities to just just fall in love with the subjects is is vital. Brilliant. Uh, right, going on to sort of the, the pre-plan question. So in terms of a good PE lesson, what components make that up? So what, what needs to be included for a PE lesson to be seen as, as good, as great, as outstanding from an offset point of view? I think, you know, for me personally, and, you know, listening, you know, listening back to the first couple of episodes of this, you know, with um, with Crofty and obviously the, yeah, you know, the, the experience that you had in the room in that, in that first episode, you know, something that came across was the fact that a word they kept saying was fun. You know, it didn't matter if you coached in academies or you were t- teaching in primary schools, then that fun. And, and for me, the success 
what makes a high quality PE lesson is if every child leaves that lesson and can't wait for the next one, then for me, that's success because that means we've done something right. Now, obviously the, the hard bit is, right, well, what makes them want to come back and, 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 and make them fall in love with PE? And um, I think there's, you know, certain things which, which encompass that. So for me, it, it's about ensuring that PE isn't just for those, the likes of us who grew up being sporty, if you like, and, um, you know, went to all different clubs and played lots of different sports, but those, those children who, you know, might be a little bit nervous in that environment, um, so making sure that we're adapting what we're doing to, to meet the needs of all the children in the class certainly is, 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 is a vital component to it. I think in terms of engagement and enjoyment, it's, you know, we talk about learning through games and, you know, it's not to say that's always going to be a match with two teams, a ball, two goals, but some kind of game which is going to get the children involved as opposed to, you know, standing in line, waiting for their turn to, to do something. Um but just being actively involved, whether it's an individual game, pairs, team. Um, so making it fun, making it enjoyable. And I think the biggest thing for me in terms of high quality is what do the children and the teachers in the schools perceive as success in PE? So if I think back, and I don't, I don't know what it was like for you too, if I think back to when I was at school, success in PE was very much technically based and objectives were very much right today we are learning to improve our dribbling in football or our set shot in basketball now success for the children is well am i good at doing that technically or not and i think it's it's really important to change children's perceptions of pe that success in pe isn't just about who's the best footballer or who's the best basketballer or who's the best netballer but it's about developing skills which are going to help them for the rest of their life because chances are we all know the percentages the chances are they're not going to become an elite athlete Hopefully we can help them fall in love with sports they play as long, as long as possible. But, you know, some of these skills that we can start to develop in them that, that are going to help them whatever they're going to do uh, are, is, is absolutely vital. So I think that that kind of holistic development is is key. So, you know, they'd be the, the, the things that stand out to me is what makes a higher quality PE lesson in, 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 in PE curriculum. And just, just jumping on that quickly, um, I'm thinking there might be a lot of coaches watching this who potentially don't work in... PE settings but work in football settings yeah. so like when you start talking about holistic development now I start thinking about the four corner model yeah yeah have you got any examples of like the the skills from the four corners that people could be looking to develop rather than think like who's the best footballer uh, you've got any examples of that for absolutely people? and I think you know it's about if we're if we're going to take uh characteristics from from across those four corners then it's about making making PE or football relevant to them in their life. And what I mean by that is the fact that, you know, for example, so it might be something from the from the psychological corner of building perseverance or resilience, you know, might be a key one. And it's, well, what does that mean to me in my life? So in a school setting, it's, you know, when it comes to doing your SATs in year six, you know, and you're finding it difficult to revise and, you know, things aren't going in, then do you give up? Or do you persevere? Are you resilient? And we're using PE as a vehicle to help us to develop that skill. And again, going further, so, you know, keeping with resilience and perseverance, it might be, you know, in a football setting, we're talking about, right, well, you know, in a couple of years, you're going to be doing your driving test. You know, we're, we're, de we're helping you to develop the, these characteristics and skills, which if you fail the first time, then, you know, do you give up or, or, or do we keep going? And then, you know, any, any job that you go into, you know, you're going to need, you know, skills from the social corner in terms of that teamwork, that effective communication, probably that respect, that empathy, how, how you deal with other people and how you speak to other people. And, you know, we, we might be biased, but I think PE can develop and football and sport can develop some of those characteristics better than anything else. You know, in a school, better than anything else on the curriculum because it gives us those opportunities to speak and, you know, to, um, to, to be with people and react to situations and, you know, we've all been there, we, in schools where you put them in a competitive situation and they start falling out and they start having little tantrums, accusing each other of cheating. And so, you know, I think that's the point where we can actually start to teach some of these things, right? Well, that's not how we react when we lose. That's not how we react when we win. You know, we, how can we, how can we become better people as opposed to just focusing on that, that technical corner of the four corner model like you've mentioned there? Uh, you mentioned the, the curriculum a lot of the time. Now, in a school setting, obviously, 
we've got uh, assessment that needs doing in terms of parents' evenings and, and sort of how the kids are getting on. Um, especially coming from an, an external company going in, that's what the that's what the school want to see, even if they're not always present at the lessons. I suppose football wise, that's probably your, your club philosophy or your your England daily. How important is it to assess the individuals again holistically? But then how how is best to do that? Because it's a little bit different to your traditional maths or English. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think you, you've you've summed up there in terms of that holistic development. And again, it's what do the kids see as high quality in PE? And are we assessing them just in that technical corner or are we assessing them across the board? So I'll, I'll give you an example. So going back to when I was at school um, and I, I was fortunate, I, you know, mum and dad would take me to any club that I wanted to go to outside of school. I got opportunity to play lots and lots of different sports. I know not everyone's as fortunate as that, but, but I did and that, you know, helped me to fall in love with PE as a subject. Um, and as a result, PE was always, you know, one of my better grades when I got my report card. Um, and, and at secondary school, we used to get, it was essentially one to 10. You know, you got, at the end of each term, you got a, a mark one to 10 for how well you were doing in that subject. And PE was always a, you know, always a nine or a 10 for me. Not so much in the other subjects, but nine or 10 for, for PE was always, always up there. And I, I remember it vividly last day of the first term of year eight. So day before the Christmas holidays and... I got my got my report card, took it home, and I can still picture my dad's face now as he opened it and it opened it and P had gone down to a three. And you know, it's you know, I thought, right, that's it, no Christmas presents for me this year. <laughs> but uh, essentially, you know, that first half term of year eight we'd done gymnastics and the second half term of year eight we'd done dance. Now I'm not a gymnast and I'm de- I'm definitely not a dancer, and but I I'd just been assessed in that technical corner how well, can I perform in those subjects? And it wasn't until the parents evening after Christmas holidays that, you know, my PE teacher was like, oh, you know, technically wasn't brilliant, but, you know, never gave up, you know, couldn't quite do that backward roll after six weeks, but never gave up trying and, you know, and, you know, in the dance was was helping kind of, you know, show some leadership skills and choreograph some of the stuff, even though I technically couldn't execute it, but none of that had been taken into consideration. So I think when we talk about assessment, it's, again, it's, it's making sure that the children understand that, you know, you might not technically be up here compared to other people in the class, but if you've got leadership skills, if you've got perseverance, if you've got resilience, um, then these are the, these are the things that are, are also going to be important for, for the rest of your life. So I think, you know, when schools are, are, are assessing in PE, it's, it's, it's taking that into account. And, and we often talk, you know, in a primary styles context, primary, primary styles, we talk about the primary styles values, you know, in terms of embedding them and using them as a framework to assess against, you know, certainly the work we do with individual schools the majority of schools have their set of school values or characteristics that they want to develop with a, with a child and I think again PE is a really good opportunity to to teach those to develop them but also then assess how the children are doing against those values as opposed to just concentrating on are you technically good at this particular skill in this particular sport if that makes sense yeah yeah definitely um so the last big question around the the PE side of it so you've mentioned lots of sort of qualities or components of a, a good PE lesson and assessment and developing the, the pupils in other ways more than just technically. But in terms of being a good PE teacher, and I suppose this goes along to a, a coach as well, what are the key skills or traits that you'd expect from a good PE teacher? I think I think the, probably a key thing to understand in a primary school context is the fact that, you know, probably the majority of the teachers or a lot of the teachers aren't PE specialists and you know if they've had bad experiences of PE themselves when they were growing up we then add to the fact that you know when they're training to be a teacher that the amount of training they get in PE is probably going to be a lot less than other subjects on the curriculum if we add those things together with then the fact that they might have a very small space to deliver the PE lessons in they might have 30 children in the class you've got an academy footballer and you've got someone who when the ball comes to them they go like that because they're petrified of it and you've got everything in between um, maybe not not a lot of equipment, weather issues. You know, I think it's it's understandable that a lot of primary teachers maybe don't have the confidence to um, to teach PE. And if we relate that to you know grassroots coaches, a lot of grassroots coaches are, are kind of there because they're the person who stepped forward, as opposed to you know being a, you know passionate about coaching themselves. So I think that's you know if 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 we use that as a starting point, then. 
you know, making sure that you are the best role model you can be, even if you don't have that specialism or expertise. So in a primary school context, I think a big a, a big win for me as a primary teacher is just putting your tracksuit on the pair of trainers because that's giving value to the to the subject straight away. Whereas if you're standing there, you know, and you're sharing time, you see it on the side, then you're probably saying, well, this subject's not as important as others. And again, it's trying to show as much enthusiasm, even if it's not something that you're passionate about yourself. You know, for me personally, I don't think beyond a, a safe, happy, loving home life, I don't think there's anything as important in a child's life at that age than, than high quality PE, because for me, nothing else is going to go and affect the rest of their life as much as that. And the relationship that they have with movement and play and and, and being active, you know, is, is going to affect their life more than anything else. So um, in terms of the characteristics, just showing enthusiasm for the subject and, and giving them opportunities to play. And again, it's you don't have to, to be a high quality teacher in a primary school or a high quality grassroots coach. You don't know, need to know the ins and outs of lots of different sports or football. You know, you just need to give them opportunities to play, opportunities to develop characteristics which are going to help them whatever they want to do. And, you know, just have a few things in your locker to, to be able to adapt it so that, that 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 academy footballer or county netballer is, you know, still being challenged. But the one who's petrified of a ball when it comes near them is, is also being supported. And, you know, uh, you know, the step principle and uh, things like that are really useful in terms of that context. So I think it's it's just ensuring the children have fun, giving them a, an environment where they can get to play and play games and just making sure that, you know, we're adapting what to, what's happening to meet the needs of the individuals in the class. Good. And then uh, last one, obviously you mentioned about you not expecting to be a coach because of how sort of the communication side of it was. Yeah different to what your skill set was how important is it it's the communication side of it and not only that how important is it to to be yourself with it as well absolutely and i think you know we all know that working with children as soon as you work with children for the five minutes this they suss you out and you know like i said if i tried to be that you know have a have a have a group in front of me and try to scream and shout with them they're probably going to work up the two minutes that oh, that's not him do you know what i mean and um I think it's you know being yourself is really important, and also I'd you know you know in our organisation obviously we've got Gareth Southgate and Serena at the top who you know certainly I won classes like those, those coaches who are going to scream and shout. But in terms of effective communicators, I'd say that they're, they're the best in the world. You know and how they get their messages across and externally and internally, and I think that communication is vital. And just just I know it's it's, it's cliche, but getting to know the players and understanding them as people is going to help with that communication because if they know that you're interested in them, then they're going to be interested in what you've got to say to them. So um, I don't think it's a case of being, you know, this this person that people are afraid of and oh, I've got to listen to it because, he's, you know, I'm scared of him, but just just being able to relate to them, whether it is in a class of 30 in the primary school or whether it's, a, you know, a team of elite players that, you know, just getting to know them as people is going to, going to make your job easy and, you know, then how you communicate with them becomes really straightforward. Good so, stuff. Uh, the next section's called the the Fall Five. So it, it's basically just five quick fire questions uh, linked to, to yourself as a coach. So number one is, what's the best bit of advice you've ever received as a as a coach or PE teacher? Um, best bit of advice. Um, so I'll probably go back to my first ever day as a PE teacher. So starting, just qualified, and um, there was a teacher in my department called Martin Jackson. And I remember it vividly. I remember exactly where I was in the office when he said this to me. And he said, um, you know, you've chosen to be a PE teacher. So come to work every day and aim to be the best PE teacher in the world. And, you know, and, and then he went on to say, and he said, and when, when you're driving home after water, be the best driver on the road. And when you get home and you're washing your dishes tonight, make them the cleanest dishes that anyone's ever seen. And, you know, what he was only saying is whatever you do in life, you know, just have the highest standards and be the best you can be. And I think... That is something that, you know, straight away when you said that, that sprung to mind straight away because, you know, I'm never going to be the best PE teacher in the world. I'm never going to be the best driver in the world. But if we're aiming for that, then you're always setting yourself the highest standards. And I think that can only lead to to a, a degree of success in whatever you do. So, yeah, that that's a, certainly the best advice I'd say. Got. Um, if you were going to speak to a new coach or PE teacher, 
what bit of advice would you give them starting out? I think, you know, particularly, you, you know, coaching, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of competition out there for, for opportunities. Um, my advice to, to someone starting out would be that just put yourself out there, take risks and, and create opportunities for yourself because, you know, for example, if you want to be an academy football coach, no one's going to knock on your door one day and say, here's a, here's a Sunderland track suit, get yourself down to the, the academy. You know, it's, you know, put yourself out there, take some risks, um, my, my, my favorite, my favorite quote is Muhammad Ali quote saying, um, "You know, he who is not courageous enough to take risks will accomplish nothing in life." And I think that's a great mantra to live by because if you don't take risks, don't put yourself out there, don't volunteer to do things, then you you probably not get you're not going to get opportunities. So yeah, just just put yourself out there and be, be my advice. Uh, how important has a mentor been to you throughout like, your career? I think you know mentors are vital. Um, I'd say that. For me, mentors, role models, it's it's the network that you surround yourself with. Um, I remember someone once said to me, never be the cleverest person in a room. And I think that's, that's great advice because, you know, it, it's not really going to happen to me. But, you know, if, you know, you're always in a room. There's always people you can learn from. And it's, it's who you surround yourself with. So, you know, I mentor, mentioned Martin Jackson when I started teaching. There was Jonathan Newton as well, who uh, works in the department. And they were... They were mentors, but also role models to me when I first started teaching because they, you know, they were up here in terms of their teaching and the standards that they held. And for me to get up there every day, I had to go in and work hard and look at what they were doing. Um, I mentioned, you know, Gordon Staniforth, you know, my tutor um, in the early part of my, my coaching qualifications. And he was the one who kind of gave me belief that actually you've got a skill set from teaching that can, can make you an effective coach. And then obviously when I joined the FA, um, I'm surrounded by role models every day, mentors. Um, when I first started in my immediate team, I had Chris Bramall and, and Chris Welburn, who I know you've both done some work with before, and they were in my immediate team, you know, still speak to them on a, on a daily basis and getting advice from them all the time. And again, it's about those high standards that you want to meet. Um, and then I, I'd say that, you know, ultimately the, the biggest mentors in my life have been my parents, my mum and dad, who, you know, Hopefully, I've always, or certainly, I've always tried to install values in me that hopefully make me the best person I can be and a decent person. And I think, you know, like I said, mentors for me is the network that you surround yourself with. And if you're surrounding yourself with people who are, you know, really good at what they do and really good at what you want to do and the type of people or type of people that you want to be, then you're always going to be learning something. And, and I think that's vital. Um. Who's the best player you've coached and why? Best player I've coached. Do you know what? I'm going to I'm gonna say that the majority of my coaching has been in the foundation phase and YDP phase. So a lot of the players that I've coached are still making their way in the game. So um, I think it'd be unfair to single anyone out and put some pressure on. I know it's a little bit of a cop out, but I think the players that are springing to mind in my head now, the best players aren't just the ones who are technically gifted they're the ones who've got something else as well you know they're the ones who um you know got that desire to be the best they're the ones who will ask you questions and they'll challenge you as a coach or they'll challenge you as a teacher and why are we doing this what you know what am i getting from this and they want to know more but then they're also the the players who at the end of the session they're the ones who are carrying the footballs in without being asked and you know so for me those those best players are the, are the ones who you know Lots of people can be technically good, but to be the best, you've got to have, have something else. And again, going back to that four corners, it, it's across those four corners. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to single out anyone individually. Well, I, I will say on my uh, few years ago, my um, B license assessment, I had uh, I was doing a goalkeeping topic, so it was defending from crosses. And I had uh, Nicky Weaver in goal for me, who was ex-Manchester City, you know, nearly 100 Premier League appearances. He's played there. Uh, you know, England and the 21s, how many caps. And I, I was there, you know, coaching him as a goalkeeper. You know, come on, Nicky, can you just move your body slightly this way? All right. And, and so that was that was quite a challenge, you know, as a, a, at the time, a level two coach doing when you were the assessment. So, um, yeah, some of the things, it was quite a challenge to coach him when uh, he, he was one of the best goalkeepers I've ever seen in my life. So, yeah, and then he's done so. And then the final one is what's the best coaching purchase you've ever made? I think. Um, I would say not directly linked to coaching, but it's probably had 
the biggest effect on my coaching is you know in this job um probably in the car for 10 sometimes 20 hours a week and best purchase i've made is is a subscription to audio books because um just rather than that being dead wasted time traveling up and down the country it's an opportunity to to, to constantly be learning and um and, and so i'd say yeah that that's definitely had the biggest effect on my coaching not just from a technical point of view but probably you know leadership communication point of view as well so yeah that would be my best purchase so um so that's the the end of the the coffee club podcast for today hopefully the the viewers will and enjoy watching it back and uh taking some of the advice on board that you've given them obviously jake's been here to, to support that conversation as well which has been great um thanks for your time really appreciate it me. appreciate it. um we'll be back in a, a month with a, another guest and, and another topic all right thanks very much thank you very much cheers thank you.